Um, and uh, well, this, those structures, of course, and um, sometimes may bother you because you, you need to, to fill them more or less because they are, of course, cap capital intensive, etc. And well, this is really uh, the type of management you should care. It's flexibility on one hand and the robustness on the other. And that's really the task of management to, to have, let's say, the balance between those two, to know what's the strategy, but sometimes like those last four months with the COVID-19 crisis to, to be flexible and to change strategy maybe, and to go from a steady supply chain maybe to online channel. We, we saw this a lot uh, in North America. We saw this a lot in Europe, this change of, let's say, the end customer uh, habits. And so also this flexibility you need in your day-to-day uh, -day operations. Well, let's go to this, this supply chain. So this supply chain at the bottom of this slide, you see a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, companies, a lot of uh, chains in, in the supply chain from breeding, propagation, production, etc. And of course, there are differences everywhere in the world how this supply chain is, is built. But in general, we are looking at a value in the supply chain. Who is, well, who is giving value for for its money, who uh, adds value to the supply chain. And if you're just, well, just a me too company, then you're not adding value in the supply chain. So you should be aware of uh, what's my, my mission, what's my vision, and, and do I add value in the supply chain? Because on both sides, on the, let's say, the retail market and the breeder, they are squeezing otherwise the, the the in-betweens. So in general, growers, wholesalers, logistic companies should be aware of this squeezing, uh, well, uh, characteristic of the supply chain. And uh, because of the economies of scale, a lot of growers now look for, let's say, an integration of the supply chain. They, they well, look for packaging, uh, they look for uh, maybe a part of young plant propagation, uh, etc. So. Everyone is looking at adding value in supply chain. And uh, so this slide is maybe, there's a lot of information on this slide and I'll, I'll stick to it uh, for a couple of minutes. Maybe start on the right side uh, of the slide, the growth drivers for uh, greenhouse production. And I think uh, Hido already taught told something about these growth drivers, and I told you also uh, about some of them. Uh, for example, the retailers want 365, 24-7 uh, well, supply of fresh vegetables, of nice fruits, and of uh, good flowers, good fat flowers of potted plants. Um, so in these modern retail formats, um, well, they are maybe combined with online formats also, and you should be aware of in your uh, operations that you can deliver every day. Um, the preference for local uh, and maybe politics from the last two, three years, we see more and more politics, maybe in North America, also in Russia, also in China. There is something like food security and the security for vegetables within the own uh, boundaries. So, uh, let's say the, the free trade of vegetables and fruits is maybe under pressure. Uh, and this local preference, I'm sorry, this could give some opportunities in uh, new markets. There are the sustainability requirements already mentioned, um, energy, fertilizers, all kinds of inputs. Uh, well, uh, you, you need to be aware of this. Uh, the, the new let's say customer, the new end consumer is looking at the, the footprint and uh, for sure the retailers are. So uh, you, you, you better be uh, <laughs> looking for your strategy if you're uh, working on this issue. Uh, population growth, you should be aware of what's the population growth in your area where your uh, product is going to. Like I said, Europe, maybe zero, 0.5% population growth, North America, 1 to 1.5% population growth each year, uh, emerging markets 2 to 3%. But what's also happening 
is that in North America, in Europe, the population is aging. And an aging population, well, I heard Guido was 53, I'm 57 years old. My, my, my diet, my everyday diet is changing. And you could be, let's say, responding to it. Could maybe give my, uh, my vitamins, by, uh, not by a pill, but by a vegetable. Uh, the urbanization, more people are working and, and also living in uh, metropolitan areas worldwide. Uh, sometimes people ask me, uh, and it's just a small anecdote, I would like to export to China. And I always say, don't go export to China. No, go export your business to Shanghai or to Hong Kong or Guangzhou or Beijing. Take a metropolitan area as your specific target for export. Because that's more than more than enough. One such area has more inhabitants than the Netherlands. Um, there's uh, on the right side the legislation, of course. Well, we have this discussion about medicinal cannabis, recreational cannabis, and everywhere in, the, in some states in the U.S., of course, the regulations are different. In Europe, regulations are different between countries. Uh, and well, we we saw, of course, the first bankruptcies already in cannabis growing, but we saw also some promising uh, companies. So be aware of this new opportunity and look for it. Uh, the capital influx, what you see in North America, what you see in Europe is that uh, equity companies are looking into this, this new business because they see opportunities. And I'll come to that later on. Food safety requirements and availability of resources and video already mentioned. And what we think as a bank, we are financing approximately 8,000 hectares of high-tech greenhouses. What we think on the left side is that in the, let's say, colder climate zones of the world, Canada, Russia, and northern part of Europe, there is a preference for high-tech glass houses, as I call them. And in more Mediterranean climate zones, you see this preference for plastic greenhouses. Currently, worldwide, we have approximately 500,000 hectares for vegetables and 100,000 hectares for uh, floriculture and glass houses, really with glass, uh, that's approximately 50,000 hectares, which is, comes close to 125,000 acres of uh, glass house worldwide. And what we expect for the next, we are, let's say, five to 10 years is it a yearly grow, growth of uh, low-tech greenhouses like, uh, like plastic greenhouses, approximately 5% per year, high-tech greenhouses, approximately 5 to 10% per year, and uh, some growth for vertical farming. Vertical farming is still very, very small. So high growth percentage doesn't mean so much. It is relatively very small compared to high-tech greenhouses. Uh, so. We, we, have, we have full confidence that this soilless production will uh, rise the next five to ten years. Um, and what's happening in that greenhouse? So it's not a greenhouse, just a greenhouse. No, it's, it's happening a lot. On the right side, you see some targets. You see some goals, some objectives of, of what you're looking for. Saving labor, for example. We saw during the COVID-19 crisis this, this uh, dependence on people from abroad. In North America, like California, Mexicans are doing the job. In Europe, Polish or Romanian people are doing the job. In, in Spain, people from Morocco. In Australia, people from Philippines and Fiji. In Colombia, there are the people from Venezuela coming in. So everywhere in the world where there's a high density horticulture, the picking labor, the harvesting labor is, is done by people from abroad. And so you have to improve the labor circumstances, we think, or you have to, let's say, automate and robotize. The, the, and that's also a kind of improvement because then the repetitiveness of the work uh, is, is lower and it's more interesting to work in horticulture. We have to increase efficiency. That's of course also part of this automation robotization programs, more sustainability, management of risks, 
as we saw in the last four months, we really have to look at risks. We have to look at uh, some uh, borders between countries. We have to, to look at our supply. Is, is my supplier able to, to deliver the product on time, etc.? Do, do I need more stocks? That's a kind of robustness in the supply chain. Um, change seasonality, of course, is one of the aspects because this supermarket wants uh, 365 days, 24 7 this product. So, with LED, for example, or with some D light, but let's say the model LED variations, you could create your 365 deliveries. And something you should be aware of is management shortage. And maybe, and I think some of the, let's say, uh, some of the, the uh, things you can do is uh, like, think using artificial intelligence, for example, and I think this will be a subject of, of lots of discussions the next coming years, is the management shortage. You, you will look for uh, people with, with grower uh, ability, etc., but you can help them maybe with uh, algorithms uh, and you need this uh, cameras, sensors, detection, etc. So a lot of going on, lot of things going on in horticulture. But let's just have a quick look at growing media, because there's a lot, of, lot going on in growing media too. Here's some recent uh, news articles about this industry, which is supplying the greenhouse sector. So it's a, it's a very, it has a high value for the greenhouse business to have a good growing media industry. And there are some, let's say, aspects, some characteristics. So sourcing is something a growing media uh, company is, well, it's, it's, it's important for them to have a peat box, to have access to fire, etc. There is this hobby market and professional market. How do they fit together? Or how do I uh, serve them? There is something like the climate agreement. I know the United States didn't sign it, but uh, I think in the next five to 10 years, it will come over and over again, that we have to do something about climate and carbon dioxide uh, emission, greenhouse emissions. So it will be on the agenda. There is this peat restoration uh, that, that you uh, can ask for. And I think if you, as a grower, don't ask for it, then the supermarket will do it, or the end consumer, the civil society organization will do it. There is a consistency in quality you need and uh, general sustainability issues like logistics, for example. Um, so it's a challenge in the world, not only for the greenhouse industry, but also for the uh, growing media sector, which is supplying the greenhouse business. And first of all, the consistency, of course. That's well, you could say your basic product, the chemical, the physical, and the biological uh, issues. And biological, you, could, you can think of uh, biostimulants or mycorrhiza, for example. There's a lot of research going on. Substitution, because peat, like I already said, it's in discussion with this climate agreement, etc. And you can look at coir, at compost, at bark, wood, Perline stone wall and maybe some new uh, substitutions. Water, yeah, I'll, I'll say it here at Kekila. <laughs> Still, it is a substitute, Spagna maybe, or Biocraft, and you need a lot of research and development. And it's of course also about this combination of uh, a lot of uh, growing medium. 